Girlfriends, episode number 388. Find your peace with Dr. Mario Sacasa. Hello and welcome to Girlfriends. I'm Danielle Bean. I'm a wife and a mom and I'm on a mission to help you know your worth as a woman so you can find peace, balance and joy in family living. This week, our special guest is Dr. Mario Sacasa and he's here to talk about overcoming stress and anxiety and finding peace. What more could you want? Let's get going. Hey, girlfriend, thank you so much for being here today for the newest episode of the Girlfriends Podcast. I always love to connect with you here. If you are a long time or sometime listener, I want to welcome you back. But if this is your first time listening to the Girlfriends Podcast, I want to give you a special welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Glad you're checking out what we have to offer. And I hope you're going to like it and want to become a regular part of the Girlfriends community. Thanks so much for being here. So this week, we're talking about peace finding peace. And I can't wait to share this conversation I had with Dr. Mario Sacasa because he talks about it from, you know, being um, a, a counselor. He talks about it from a clinical standpoint, but also very practically, like how physically things like stress and anxiety affect our lives. So I can't wait to share that conversation with you. But we can't talk about finding peace without me sharing a little nugget from one of my favorite books on this topic, which is by Father Jacques Philippe called Searching for and Maintaining Peace. Cannot recommend this book enough. Such a beautiful little book. And it's it really is a little book. You can totally read this like and you can bring it around with you can keep it in your bag. It's a very practical book. All of Father Jacques Philippe's writings are that way. But I, I want to share this one quote from from that book here in which Father Jacques writes, consider the surface of a lake above which the sun is shining. If the surface of the lake is peaceful and tranquil, the sun will be reflected in this lake. And the more peaceful the lake, the more perfectly it will be reflected. So that's a beautiful parallel between what happens in us when we are at peace, because it's when we're at peace that we can more perfectly reflect God, more perfectly receive God and give him glory and reflect the glory of God through the things that we're doing in our lives. Not when we are not at peace, when we're stressed and anxious and going in a hundred directions and not really sure about where our focus should be. When we're feeling that way, when we're feeling frazzled and pulled in a lot of different directions, we are not as able to reflect the glory of God. So this is truly what we're called to do. And when I read that book, Searching for and Maintaining Peace by Father Jacques Philippe, one thing that I really came away with was just this understanding of that's all we want is peace. You know, you might be praying about something that's that you're struggling with a lot, right? Maybe there's a relationship that's causing a lot of conflict in your life and you're bringing that to prayer. What do you want? You want peace, right? Sometimes we get attached to praying for a particular outcome. Like maybe there's a job you especially want and you're praying to get this particular job or find this particular kind of work. When really what we should pray for in a circumstance like that is to pray for peace in our work. Or maybe you have a financial stress or a health stress and you're like, you know, Lord, heal me of this illness or heal this loved one of this health problem. Or, you know, you're worried about your finances and you're like, Lord, help me, you know, to pay this particular bill. Like, give me this X, X amount of dollars, right? Like we pray for specific outcomes, but truly what we want we want peace. You want peace about your health. You want peace in your relationships. You want peace in your finances, in your work, in your parenting, in your marriage. That's what we want. So I really like this focus on peace. But there are things that get in the way. Stress and anxiety. Think about who wants you to be stressed and anxious. It's not Jesus, right? This isn't coming from God. And these things that distract us and pull us away and make us feel stressed out and make us feel overwhelmed in life, that's not God's plan for you to be walking around that way. Of course, we're all going to go through stages of life that are more stressful than others, more anxiety ridden than others. And it's natural to be concerned about the things that we worry about, the things that we care about. But ultimately, what I love about Father Jacques Philippe is that he calls us into deeper relationship with God because that's it. That's it. That's all you need to do, right? That's the answer to everything, everything you might be struggling with. Father Jacques Philippe reminds us, especially in that passage about a reflection on a lake, think of yourself that way. Are you going to allow yourself to become disturbed, all those waves and ripples, and then not be able to reflect God in the way that he intends? I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at that call to peace 
and to remind ourselves that that's what God wants for us. So and we're going to we're going to talk with Dr. Mario Sacasa a little bit about this, but also more about kind of the practical aspects and like the clinical side of like what is going on in your body when you get stressed, when you get anxious and how can we find peace? He's going to be a great help toward that. I can't wait to share this conversation with you. Take a listen. Dr. Mario Sacasa is joining me here on Girlfriends today. Dr. Sacasa is the Associate Director of the Faith and Marriage Apostolate of the Willwoods Community in Louisiana. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist and operates a private counseling practice in Charlotte, North Carolina. He earned a PhD in counselor education and supervision from the University of Holy Cross in New Orleans. Dr. Sacasa travels the country offering lectures to dioceses, parishes, seminaries, and college campuses on the themes of marriage, relationships, sexuality, hope, and positive psychology. He's the creator and host of the Always Hope podcast, a long-form interview show aimed at helping the listener grow in their emotional and spiritual health. He's also host of a brand new series with us here at Good Catholic about overcoming stress and anxiety. More on that later, but for now, please welcome Dr. Mario Sacasa. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate that. I feel like there should be like a clap track or something after that. <laughs> it should be Let's welcoming go. in. Let's go. <laughs> you need some like entrance music. <laughs> yeah, exactly I what I need. <laughs> I need theme music. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So we recently did an online uh, virtual event together, which was focused on the topic of stress and anxiety and this new series that you have coming out with Good Catholic. In fact, by the time this podcast publishes, it will be available um, because it's launching August 8th. So these are focused both on stress and anxiety. Why, why do you think this is a timely topic? Because I would love for us to dive into this right here on the podcast today. There's a lot of reasons why it's a time, timely topic. So let's mm -hmm. just kind of break some of these things down. I think the most immediate reason is uh, the pandemic. And I think we're, we're, we all, we notice and this, the research is very clear uh, that coming out of the pandemic, there has been increase across the board with depression, anxiety rates, uh, poor mental health. Uh, everything has been impacted uh, in some form or fashion by, by mm -hmm. the pandemic. Anecdotally, I, I experienced that as a therapist where me and most of my colleagues all develop waiting lists because one of the, the, I would say, strange benefits or accidental benefits of the pandemic is that every therapist got comfortable doing virtual sessions. And so that made us more accessible to everybody uh, within the state and you didn't have to live within a geographic region. Um, but that, mm -hmm. But also the need itself was going up because people were experiencing a lot of uncertainty uh, in their life and a lot of fear. And so a lot of more folks were reaching out for, for counseling. Um, so that's one clear reason why mm -hmm. we've seen kind of an increase and why we want to be able to speak to that. The other reason I would say is, is maybe a little bit more broader, uh, not just tied specifically to the pandemic, but a cultural shift that has occurred um, over the last whatever 40 or 50 years that I think we're really beginning to start seeing kind of the, the impact of, which is when we talk about uh, in Catholic circles, you know, the breakdown of the family and, and, and this isn't just to be a cliche, but that there are real, you know, cultural consequences when we start losing um, those uh, reference points, when we start losing those foundation points. Mm -hmm. And when we lose that foundation of security within family, but then also security within a deeper sense of meaning. And this is what faith and religion has often been able to provide a society. But, but, but us, you know, as Catholics, we, we, we recognize that. So as we've seen a, a decrease in, in faith and meaning, as we've seen a decrease in, in family structures, we're again seeing, we're starting to see kind of these increases as well. And so the things that we're trying to kind of substitute for this, um, mm -hmm. we're, we're recognizing just aren't holding water as, as much as uh, it, we have been sold uh, that, that they can. And, right. uh, and so, so we're recognizing, we're seeing those trends. And then the, the last piece that I will say, and free to, dive into any of these as we want is yeah. is as the rise of 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 isolation that's coming from from phone usage uh, uh, and so you know you can see particularly with young people um that there's a clear line in 2012 which is when 50 percent so the iphone was invented in 20 2007 but then you get to 2012 and that's when the, the american population for the first time 50 percent of the american population had a smartphone in their pocket so it took mm -hmm. about five years for over over half the country to have a smartphone in their pocket, and what we what we noticed right then is decrease, particularly among young people in their mental health standards. And so we see also kind of even now kind of this correlation between the amount of time spent online 
and an increase uh, in anxiety and in stress. And so the irony of this course is that it is an online course. We're going to have you on a screen. <laughs> We're going to have you on a screen. But, <laughs> but my hope is at least that the quality of the content that you're receiving uh, is going to help you to actually disengage uh, right. a little bit and uh, to be able to kind of reconnect with the, the, the reality of the circumstances that you find yourself in, uh, to be able to get that sense of stability and security that, that we're all looking for. So there's a lot of reasons why we're seeing this increase, yeah. um, but those are just kind of three that, that are kind of coming off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, let's start with the phones because you know, here mm -hmm. it is right here. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody yeah, yeah, has yeah. it right there. Everybody's you know? got like, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm always amazed because if you just kind of take a step back and observe our society a little bit, like mm -hmm. it's amazing. Like you look in an airport, like everybody's just on their phone. Everybody, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody. I'm not judging people, right? But yep, yep, yep. like that's that's significant. And then you know, let's talk about our young people because many of our listeners here are our parents and care deeply about raising their kids with you know emotional stability and and good mental health and um you know good practices for that and but i find even good parents struggle with this how do we manage like our kids and phones because to me it mm -hmm. looks like a gigantic social experiment you know that we're kind of conducting as a culture and nobody knows what the outcome's going to be i think we see like you you just mentioned some st statistics and we we can see some of that but at the same time, it is such an ingrained part of our culture that we're not sure exactly how to handle that. Like, you know, so mm -hmm. what advice would you offer to parents in that regard? Because I know for us, like trying to decide like when and if a kid will have a smartphone and right. eventually you kind of think, well, they're going to need to, right, to live in our right. culture. I mean, I think right. some people go around with dumb phones, but I don't know. It's difficult, <laughs> right? It's different. Yes. Um, I'm not saying you can't do that. But, you know, kind of trying to figure out that balance. Do you have advice for parents in, in figuring that out with their, their young kids? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, so I would say, first and foremost, it's okay to set restrictions. And it's okay to set limitations on not just the devices, but when you actually give those devices. Mm -hmm. And I think the researchers are at this point, you know, asking for people to hold off on giving their kids smartphones until they're 16. Now that yeah. seems like ancient. I mean, you're talking about eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds getting the phones for birthdays mm -hmm. and... And so, like, I mean, to wait to say you got to wait to 16, people are probably like, that's crazy. Like, it's just can't even do that, you know? Right. We but, typically have done that. And we are the weirdos. Like, we're the weirdos. By a long too, shot. And, <laughs> by a long shot. So my oldest is 19 and he didn't have his own smartphone until he actually went away to college last year. There you and go. we we have four boys in the house and we had a number of years ago purchased a smartphone for the house that they can share. And the reason mm -hmm. that we wanted them to to share the phone is one so they can have access to send text messages in connection with their friends. But by sharing it, that kind of gives a sense of accountability uh, to sure. this device, that this isn't just your personal device, that this isn't something that you can kind of get away with doing whatever you want with it, but this is the community, this is the family device here. And so we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're sharing it. So recognizing that that's okay. Those are, those, are, those are lessons that our kids need to learn. I think sometimes we feel like, well, let's just find peace. Everybody gets their own device, everybody gets their own thing, and, and then they start arguing. But we can do that, which is one way of solving it. But another way of solving it is to teach our kids the ability to negotiate, teaching our kids the ability to actually have to compromise into into dialogue and to connect with somebody, know how to share things. Like those mm -hmm. are those are skills and virtues that they're going to need for life. So there's ways that you can kind of utilize this stuff um, in a way that I think is appropriate. Right. So I think that's one. The, the the second thing is when it comes to phones specifically, and I know there's a there's a difference between boys and girls here. Uh, you know, you you give a you give a boy a smartphone, almost always the very first thing he's going to download is some video game. You, right. you give a girl a smartphone, almost always the first thing she's going to download is a social media app. You yeah. know, and so so it's it's the way that these devices are used also uh, between uh, boys and girls. So I recognize that for girls and for guys, I know, but for girls, feel more the pressure of that kind of social connection and yeah. needing to be on needing to be on Snapchat, on TikTok, on these platforms, on Instagram so that they're feeling connected and that that becomes their space of of engagement. And mm -hmm. that's the place where we would have to say, well, how do we make sure that these devices aren't the sole place of engagement for our young people? Right. And and if these devices are ways to have some engagement but that it's also pushing connection in reality, like if you're using your 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 phone to to text and to make plans for the weekend, okay, but you're actually going to be together on the weekend. It it's it's making sure that that the device doesn't create this kind of virtual reality uh, 
no pun intended, I guess pun intended, but <laughs> virtual existence yes. that, that is completely disconnected from their physical reality. Mm -hmm. And because that's going to create a disconnect, but it's also going to create a sense of isolation. But if these devices are, are means upon which that we can actually build about it, social connection in that it encourages then uh, some type of um, real engagement or, or even at minimum synchronous conversation, not just asynchronous text messaging, but synchronous kind of dialogue, then mm -hmm. those are the ways that we're still encouraging social development um, in our teenagers. And it's that social development that is really crucial when it comes to these questions of anxiety and mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you just described is a great kind of like, it's a conversation, right? Like how mm -hmm. we're using these devices and whether mm -hmm. you get to use this device and, you know, in the way in which you're going to use this device, it, it can be kind of a developing uh, plan for, you know, your child as they're growing and as they're maturing. I, I know we for sure have had those conversations with our kids where I've said mm -hmm. like, show me you are a balanced, <laughs> healthy human <laughs> that's being right. That's that right. wants that's to right. connect with us. And <laughs> yeah. then we can talk about, you know, having yeah. this aspect in your life. But if I'm not seeing you like hanging out around the other family members, you know, being in, engaged in conversation at the dinner table, talking with your younger siblings, helping out around the house, I'm not going to feel like you need to be like getting this device and disappearing into your own private little virtual world, right? Yes, yes, exactly. That's exactly right. And so, and then even sim similarly, right, if, if they get the device and you see that they're becoming more isolated, mm -hmm. uh, then and pulling them back in and saying, listen, we got it. We got to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And this is where web tracking it isn't invasive, but it's meant to be helpful, like Covenant Eyes or Bark or any of these right. kind of uh, programs that that allow some type of screen accountability. Um, mm -hmm. All it does is it, it helps us to be able to have conversations with our kids, but it also helps our kids to to establish um, a, 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 an expectation that what they do online isn't just for uh, isn't just isn't isn't completely devoid of reality. You know what I mean? That's there's somebody else watching this. It's not just an isolating event. Yeah, so I any, think that's really key. You can do that moves 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 it away from just being an isolating experience um, is going to be crucial for us as parents. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's so valuable, you know, and I think some of it's just being realistic as a parent. Like I see some of these people that are handing their kid a smartphone at mm -hmm. the age of eight and kind of closing their eyes to it because, and right. I think it comes from, you know, not necessarily a bad will in any way, but just kind of like, mm -hmm. I don't know what else to do, like kind of giving mm -hmm. in in that way. But I really, I love what you said about like, you can set these boundaries, you can set these limitations. It's, it's actually what we're supposed to do as parents, right? Even right, if they're, right. they're fighting us, even if it's not the the popular thing to do. I remember one of my sons once saying to me, like, you don't trust me with regard to like devices and stuff. And I was like, I don't trust human nature. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm not saying you're a bad kid. I'm yeah, saying we're yeah. all vulnerable to temptations that are out there and there's nothing more tempting than that virtual world. Yeah, sometimes. that's right. And I don't trust all the high paid psychologists and savvy marketers who are pouring a lot of time and energy and resources to, right. to get you to be stuck on this device. And so like to the point that, yeah, we're all susceptible. I'm susceptible. I I, yeah. I know when I'm just kind of doom scrolling and I'm like, ah, what am I doing? Like, it's just time to get off this thing, you know, right. and that I need to go on kind of these virtual fasts. But right. to the point that you're making even about parents just feeling tired, what what I also have seen is that particularly with young, young children, we're using these devices as a way to soothe them. And so mm -hmm. two, three, four year olds, the kid starts acting up, give them the phone, you know, just give them the thing, let them let, shut them down. And, and again, I, I caution that because we want to make sure that, that their brain is developing in a healthy way. And, and a little bit of that tension, a little bit of that stress that they're experiencing isn't, isn't problematic. It's actually, it's fine for them. They're learning how to communicate a need. And then as a parent, it's our job to be able to help kind of bring about a sense of self-soothing like we're, we're helping them to navigate those emotions i'm talking about little little kids toddlers two right. three four year olds you know and so what we're doing there is we're actually helping them to grow in their own neurological development to be able to 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 learn how to self-soothe and regulate their emotions but we do that in the context of relationship if we're just giving them a phone or giving them an ipad we're short circuiting that process. And now what's happening is that they're developing this attachment response to use the, sure. the psychological term to the device and not to a human person. And so what are the ramifications of that? We don't fully know yet, but, uh, mm -hmm. but those are major concerns that, that I think we should be, we should be on top of.
Absolutely. And, you know, as you're describing that kind of like that, that what are you looking for to like soothe your child? But you know, <laughs> yeah. we have to be looking at like, what are we doing to soothe ourselves? Right? Like, mm -hmm. let's look at our own examples too. Like, what is your yes. go-to? And for sure, phones, devices, that sort of thing. But other people might use food or alcohol or sex or, you right. know, shopping or you know these things um and maybe we could talk a little bit about that because there are there are healthy responses to stress and anxiety right which are inevitable parts of life but then there are these unhealthy ones that we can develop these habits like what what advice would you would you offer to encourage people to you know kind of examine themselves in that way yeah it's, it's always a question of what is your relationship with the device and mm -hmm. with the whatever the that coping mechanism is you know and and so for example, I'll, I'll wrap myself out here a little bit, you know, like I, I don't, uh, I, I know when I am like really, really just tired, uh, like it's easy for me just to kind of grab the phone and, and want to just kind of scroll and see what the news is and see what YouTube has to say and, sure. you know, whatever else, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, like, so it, I can, I begin to realize like, this is a pattern. I'm developing this, this, this habit here. Um, or even when it comes to like alcohol, for example, I don't, I don't drink a whole, whole lot, um. But I know that if if I've had a few days in a row, or what I where I have drunk, you know, a, a alcoholic, you know, beverage or something, a, a, like two or three days in a row, for me that's a major tell because I'm not mm -hmm. a, like a regular drinker to that degree, and so it's like okay, these become opportunities for us to reflect and to say, well, what is it? What's going on in my life that's not being attended to? And I'm right. quick. I'm, I'm the, the quick lever, you know, that's what it is. All these things release dopamine in our system and dopamine is, 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 is the contentment hormone. Uh, but there's also, it's also con called the hope hormone. I mean, it's, it's about anticipation. It's about giving us a sense of relief. It, there's a lot that dopamine does, you know, for, for our neurological system. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking for is quick ways to be able to get, um, those dopamine hits. And, uh, and in some form or fast, some, some occasions, like it's fine. You know what I mean? Hey, you want to go get the sandwich, get the sandwich. You want to eat a little ice cream. That's okay. Obviously there are some morally, you know, there are lines that we just can't sure. cross. Pornography is not the same thing as, you know, going to bed, bath and beyond and, you know, looking for towels, <laughs> you know, bed, bath and beyond. Sorry. Doesn't exist. Have you anymore. been so watching my habits? I just went, I just went <laughs> bankrupt. So I shouldn't bring up. Bed, bath, and beyond. No, it's TJ Maxx. It's totally CJ Maxx. CJ Maxx. Home, goods. <laughs> home goods. Home goods. That's it. Yeah. We'll go home goods. <laughs> and so, you know, those obviously are not weighted the same morally. Right. Um, but neurologically speaking, there's there's similarities, there's similar mechanisms that that that's happening there. And so the system, this is where like our efficiency kind of works against us, you know, neurologically mm -hmm. speaking. And we're looking for quick answers and quick fixes. And it it's fine every once in a while, but if it becomes a habit and it becomes a pattern. Then, then that's when we need to kind of raise attention to it and to say, what need is not being met? Because the reality is that the quick fix is almost always a short circuit, is a shortcut, you know, to a larger gain. And the right. quick fix is almost always not sustainable in the long run. And uh, mm -hmm. and so, because it is just that. And so we have to then evaluate within ourselves, how are these kind of short-term kind of gains preventing us from actually being able to move forward in the direction that we want? Yeah. So a lot of reevaluation within ourselves. And then when we get to that awareness, then it becomes a question of accountability and discussion and bringing it up to others and helping others kind of kind of laugh with us and connect with us and help us, you know, um, because those things at the end of the day are, are what's going to be uh, the most beneficial. Right. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned connection because I feel like that's always, for me anyway, the solution when, you know, of course, connection with our creator, right? That's, yes, where, that's where we're that's supposed right. to find the answer to all of these wants and needs and that's exactly right. lacking that we're feeling, but also connection with the, the people these placed in our lives, like the meaningful connections with others, like that ultimately is what's going to soothe us. That's going to help us to, you know, put things into place and to, to manage stress and anxiety because all these other things, these quick fixes you're talking about, you know, the I like that you mentioned dopamine as well, because I'm fascinated by that, like the chemical reaction and, and, you know, ultimately the more we're using these quick fixes, at, at least I know I've discovered this, like, you know, oh, you're stressed, eat a piece of chocolate. Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're stressed, eat a piece of chocolate. You need another piece of chocolate, 
you know, you need three more pieces of chocolate and it, you're not mm -hmm. getting the same pleasure from it at all. Right. And it almost That's becomes right. like this compulsive behavior and you're just doing it because you do it. And then it's like more and more and more. And that's like, that's like the definition of like addictive behavior, right? That and is it tolerance. In small ways. Tolerance right. is the word exactly. you're looking for. Yes, that's okay. right. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. So, I mean, ultimately we're not doing ourselves any favors, especially if it's an unhealthy habit, right? Or something we're going to go to TJ Maxx and just spend ourselves into debt or something, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of looking for that hit again, right? Like, mm -hmm. but I think it's so like, you know, as, as Catholics, we have this perspective and I love that you're a, a marriage and family therapist from this Catholic perspective. Could you talk about that a little bit? Like with your clients, how do you help them like make that move toward, you know, recognizing that what we're made for is God, right? I mean, ultimately that's what we all need to recognize in, in a more full sense. Yeah. Well, I would say that most of my clients are Catholic and and understand that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they, they recognize that. And that's part of what makes it difficult when they fall into, if we want to talk about an addiction specifically, I do work with individuals who are sex addicts and, and pornography addiction. Um, and, and most of the folks that I see are Catholic and it, it becomes a real bind for them. You know, it's a, it's a real struggle to, sure. to recognize the reality of their faith and the acknowledgement and the belief that they profess, which is what you said, that we are made for the Lord and we are made for him. Right. But then this, this reality that they've also been stuck, you know, in these kind of patterns. And so, so I would say that it, it, it's, and it's not just a question of faith to say, well, just keep praying, you know what I mean? And then, and then it's going to go away. Or if you just believe it more then then this, this mechanism or this, this, addictive behavior is just going to go away. No, no, like there has to be real engagement, you know, at, at, at mm -hmm. a very intimate, very personal, very particular level. And, uh, and so it, it, re it's, it's not just that they don't believe because I think that they do. And I think most people do. It's that we recognize that we all have little vices and we all mm -hmm. have, we all have little ways that we are, are little, uh, lowercase H hypocrites, you know, and we all have little ways that we're not exactly conforming uh to 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 the path that god has for us and so what do we do in those circumstances well we avail ourselves to the ministry of the church i mean this is why christ has come to us is to set us free and so we avail ourselves to the sacraments to direction uh, to prayer to doing the things that the church has set out to do which is helping us to be able to overcome these um you know bad habits these vices these things that are that are that are gripping us and, and holding us back and so um it's a it's a slow process it's a yeah. patient process and the key to the key really to unlocking that is really having a merciful heart and attitude towards yourself and okay. not giving not just getting stuck on um on the times that you fall or the the the, the, the occasions that you don't quite live up and judging ourselves and falling into the condemnation but if we can make that shift towards mercy on ourselves, then we can avail ourselves to the mercy of God, which is then going to help us kind of continue to move forward. And so this is where the ideas such as, uh, I know uh, Father uh, Timothy Gallagher speaks about this often, you know, is that we begin again, we begin again, we begin again, like, you know, this, this notion that we start over and we keep moving and we set ourselves on, on the long term and not just in the immediate. Oh, that's so beautifully put. I, I love that. And that's very much in keeping. I think I, I'm thinking of the, the title of your podcast, Always Hope, right? Mm -hmm. That it's very encouraging. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the message we need in the world today. Those of us who are experiencing stress and anxiety and isolation in these varying degrees, that we need that gentleness and that mercy with ourselves. And, and often I, I know that, you know, I, in talking with my girlfriends and my sisters, I, especially women have this habit of just negative self-talk and yes. speaking to ourselves in ways we would never speak to another human being, right? Because yep. we're loving yep. and caring with everybody except for ourselves. Um, do you, do you have any like practical tips for ways to interrupt that? Because sometimes I yeah. think the biggest challenge is to recognize that you're the boss of your thoughts, right? You're not the victim of your mm -hmm. thoughts. You can control yeah. that and you can control that inner voice. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing up the podcast and, and the title of it. That, that was very intentional and it took me a long time to kind of settle on the name. Yeah. One of the other names that was on the table was always cynical. You know, I was like, we can go with this one. You know? <laughs> I like that you went with the positive spin. Yeah, with the positive spin. I was like, let's <laughs> let's let's go with the positive spin rather than, rather than the negative, right? Because like it's so you talk about like seduction, I guess, or or, or things that kind of give us a little sense of you know dopamine. Well, sometimes you know cynicism, complaining, criticizing others. Those things, man, are 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 man. We feel really good in those moments, right? Oh, for sure. 
And so, uh, so we have to caution all of that. So, so the, the, the notion of hope here. Okay. And so the, the question you asked is, um, what practically can we do? Well, I think this is a place of, of a little bit of self-evaluation, right? So I would ask the listeners if, uh, if, if you are, uh, for example, you know, you, you, you're, um, hanging out with people and you're maybe let's, let's set the setting, right? You're at like a, like a meeting and you got the high tables and you're all standing kind of chatting a little bit. You reach for your drink and you accidentally knock it over and it's a beautiful glass, whatever you were drinking, you know, and it falls on the ground and just shatters everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the first thought that comes into your head? You know, when, when, when that happens, I'm such Is an idiot. It, I'm such an idiot. That's exactly <laughs> it. Right. That's it. That's exactly it. I'm such an idiot. And, and think about how condemning that phrase is. Right. right. You, you, you've, you've not all, you, you've not, you've, you haven't, you, you've uh, labeled yourself an idiot because of some behavior that you did. So rather than being able to recognize the behavior as a mistake, we immediately label ourselves and mm -hmm. we immediately then move to, to that place of identity. And it's, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe whatever, all, all that stuff. And we're all susceptible to that. Sure. Um, that would be the voice of shame. And, and so we want to be able to, to navigate that voice uh, so that we can move to the place where we, where we do make the mistake we recognize that man that was a that was a fail you know as the kids say a big <laughs> fail you know like man, I, can't, I can't just mess that one up right oh right. my gosh right so but then you can kind of laugh it off and, and, and kind of get moving so so that's one pay attention to kind of what that is and and when that voice of shame's coming up how to be able to navigate that the second thing and this is another practical suggestion is that let's re, let's let's replay the scenario all right you do that what would you say to your girlfriend if if she was the one who knocked over that uh that that piece of glass. Right. I mean, you'd say that's no big deal. Like, you know, <laughs> it happens to people all the time. You know, you'd be so understanding about it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So part of the exercise is then, then learning how to be able to talk to yourself the way that you would talk to others. Right. How, how would you talk to your friends? How would you talk to your loved ones uh, in a scenario like that? And, mm -hmm. uh, and if we can start practicing that, those are habits. Those are all habits. Those are all skills that, that somehow along the way we've we've acquired, so to speak, not skills. Those are habits of, of patterns of thinking that mm -hmm. we've acquired along the way. And those patterns of thinking can change with new skill set and uh, with simple little strategies like like we just presented. Yeah. But doing that, that repeatedly, you know, doing that with, <laughs> with some discipline, you know. Until that becomes a habit, right? Until you, that like becomes a habit. Establishing that new habit. And and I, I'm glad you mentioned shame because I think that's part of the kind of the opposite of hope, right? Is where you end up when you indulge in those those thoughts and those feelings of embracing shame about your your behavior, even if it is wrong behavior, right? That mm -hmm. sometimes there's a sense of shame that you know comes from like the guilt, right? Because we know we did something wrong. But that sense of shame is like there's something wrong with me. Could you talk a little bit about that? Like the difference between guilt and shame and you know, the the one being normal and healthy and the other yeah. just the opposite of that. Yeah. So here, I'm sure most of your audience will be familiar with the work of Brene Brown. And, and so this oh, yes. is where I'm just going to kind of rip rip her off um, in her book, Daring Greatly specifically, uh, which I would strongly recommend folks to, to, to read. Mm -hmm. um, she's been a foremost researcher in this topic. And, and what she says is that guilt is about behavior. Shame is about identity. And so when we've done something wrong, we should feel guilty about it. And we should recognize that we've made some mistake and, and acknowledge it. Because if it's about behavior, then we can actually do something about it to rectify the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so so that's fine. But if we get to the place of shame, well, then shame is 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 a place of identity. And it's harder to change our identity than it is to change our behaviors. And so mm -hmm. the place of being able to, what's the anecdote to shame? Well, so, so why do we experience shame? Well, we experience shame, and I talk about this in the course, you know, we've been talking about, um, because shame is is really another version of anxiety. Shame is, a, is another version of particularly of rejection, fear of rejection, social rejection. Right. And there's reasons for that we don't have to get into right now. But that's what's happening is in some level, I've done this, I've made this mistake. I feel shame because I'm afraid I'm about to be judged and criticized, which means that I'm going to be isolated. I'm going to be rejected by the group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so so the move then is 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 towards, like we said, mercy, compassion, but then sharing with others and receiving empathy from one another. So when you're able to then bring that up, recognize that shame, communicate, articulate, it, share it with somebody in context, not something, again, here's why we need differences in, in relationships. You're not going to post that on social media. You're not going to expect your 10,000 friends on TikTok to tell you, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not going to work for you. Okay. What right. will work for you though, 
is that if you have intimacy in friendship, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's friends that you've known for, for many years, if you can then bring that before them, then receiving their, their empathy and their compassion will help mm -hmm. to rewire some of that shame because what it's going to do is it's going to calm that anxiety and it's going to help us feel again that sense of connection and, and reduce and really kind of take care of that fear that we're going to be rejected because here I am expressing this to somebody and I'm not being rejected. And I'm not, right. I'm not, I'm not being uh, condemned because of this. And so that right there is, is, is healing. That would be corrective emotional experiences. Now, mm -hmm. of course, we talk about that in the context of relationship with people, but man, if we can do that with the Lord, you know, if we can, yeah. if we can let our prayer get to that point where, where we're that intimate with God, uh, where we're able then to really bring forth these things and to receive his mercy and compassion, um, that's the stuff of the saints. Yeah, that is Oh, that's the core stuff. That's it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Yes, that's right. That's it. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah, that. Yeah. And and you, you're sharing about all of this in the new series from Good Catholic, Overcoming Stress and Anxiety. We, of course, we'll have links in the show notes over at goodcatholic.com so you can connect with that series. Before we have to wrap up, Mario, I, I, I want to talk just a little bit about the physical element of this because we've been talking a lot about the psychology of stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and our responses to it. But there's a real physical element here. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a chemical component, but then there's also physical ways that we can respond to it that you shared about in the virtual event we recently did. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with the listeners here today. Yeah. So so again, just a reminder, what is stress? What is anxiety? Why are we why do we experience this, you know, as a at a natural level? Well, it it's it's a preparatory response. And that means that we, we see a threat and we get cortisol, we get adrenaline. We get a little, you know, hit of of these stress hormones inside of us because they're preparing our muscles and our body. We increase our heart rate, right? That's getting more blood pumping through our system. All of this is preparing us to to otherwise fight this threat or to fly, you know, flee from it and and, right. and get away from it as fast as possible. So we need that kind of quick adrenaline, cortisol, kind of blood pumping kind of system to be able to defend ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, it's just a, a little way of how we all turn into the Hulk. You know what I mean? Like it's just, <laughs> it's like the Hulk, the Hulk is a, is a, is a, is a exaggerated version of this response that we all have within us, you know? Right. But the problem is that like, you know, this is supposed to be short term responses. These are supposed to be experiences that we have and, and then, and then we complete the stress cycle which I'll talk about in a second. And then we you know, are able to kind of navigate and, and be at peace again. And we move on back to a normal day. Yeah. And the thing with our world is that we no longer live in an environment where these little things are, are, are short, are short or, or quick in, in, in kind of nature. Mm -hmm. Rather we live now in an environment where we have a, a low level, long duration, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say experience with stress and anxiety. So the phones, right? What do the phones do to us? They always create stress. Why? Because we're market, we're, we're bombarded with marketers are always telling us we're not enough, or we see people on posts that we never feel like we're enough. So mm -hmm. the scarcity kind of pandemic, so to speak, in that driving stress, you know, boss relationships connect. I mean, like it's just everything is is, is a potential threat, and so this negativity bias kind of takes over. Sure. And so we have to learn how to navigate all that. We'll talk about that in the course. But to answer your question specifically, is to recognize that 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 there's something biological that's happening within us. That it's not just because I lack faith. It's not just because I'm I'm a bad Catholic and I'm not saying my rosary enough. It's yeah. that there are things that are happening by at a biological level, which then require a biological response, which is why we turn to cookies or or you know <laughs> <laughs> chocolate or drinking, you know, like right. we're looking for physical kind of responses. So what are healthier ways to be able to do that? Well, one, and I talked about this in, in our, in our, um, you know, summer series that we did in, in the conversation we had recently mm -hmm. is that because it's biological, because that adrenaline and cortisol is actually pumping and it's meant to do something, well, go do something with it. This is where right. a good walk will, will, will help go mm -hmm. garden, you know, pull the weeds out, like go, go on a, go work out, go on a run. Mm -hmm. And certainly you could do that on the end of a stressful situation. I, I saw a shirt, I'm a runner and I saw a shirt or no, it was a shirt. It was something else. Somebody posted on Instagram uh, that said like, um, I'm, I'm one run away from feeling good or I'm one <laughs> run away from being happy, you know, type of thing. And I'm like, that is absolutely true. Like, yeah. like my wife knows that she's like, when you're, I'm, like, when I'm being surly and I'm kind of being a jerk, whatever. She's like, just why don't you go take, go on a run? Why don't you just get out for a few minutes and then come back and then we'll talk. Okay. Yep. All right. You know, like, okay. 
it know, makes a huge so difference. It <laughs> makes a huge difference. And so one res- like closing the, the 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 stress cycle, you know, and 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 doing what the body wants to do. So mm-hmm. operating again in nature in accordance with with your nature is one. But then also again having regular um, exercise regimes um, will also help to be able to burn some of that kind of low level stress and uh, hormones that 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 we are experiencing. Yeah. So there's yeah. a couple of things to, to offer for folks. Definitely. And we'll we'll dive deeper in all of that. Mario shares so beautifully and, and fully in this, like the full scope of how to deal with stress and anxiety, covering all of these bases in that course that's available from Good Catholic, Overcoming Stress and Anxiety. That's available over at goodcatholic.com slash series. If you want to go and check that out. Of course, we'll have the links in the show notes over at goodcatholic.com. Uh, Mario, what about your website? Could you share with us a URL or you know where we can follow you on social media? Let us know some mm-hmm. of those things. Yeah, so at Dr. Mario Sacasa, Dr. Mario Sacasa, um, on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I can't believe I led with LinkedIn. I don't know why that's, that that was wrong. <laughs> Instagram, nerdville, <laughs> nerd, nerd. <laughs> to tell you what I was doing before we got on the phone call. So like, <laughs> you're a professional. Right, so, it's okay. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. So so certainly you know check me out at at, at Dr. Mario Sacasa. Or you can mm-hmm. go to our website at faithandmarriage.org. And at faithandmarriage.org, you can listen to all any episodes that we have of the Always So podcast. If any of the things that I've been saying in this kind of integrated perspective of Catholicism and psychology, I mean, that's the show in, in a nutshell. And right. I have experts on it to talk about it. But at Faith and Marriage, we also, our primary apostolate is, is marriage ministry. And so we do have a number of marriage retreats that we offer on a regular basis. And we would love for you to come, you and your spouse, to come and join us on one of our upcoming retreats. You can get a full list of that you know, on the website. So go to faithandmarriage.org or follow me on any of the social media platforms at Dr. Mario Sacasa. Excellent. And we will have all of those linked up in the show notes at goodcatholic.com. Mario, thank you so much for being here today and sharing. Thank you for the recent event and thank you for, you know, doing the series with Good Catholic. But I've really enjoyed our conversation today and I'm really grateful for the good work that you're doing. Yeah, praise the Lord. Thanks, Daniel, for this opportunity. This was great. Great. All right. We've got more of the show coming up for you, but first we're going to take a quick break. I'm Danielle Bean and you're listening to the Girlfriends Podcast. Stress and anxiety cripples us because it prevents us from being able to take the steps forward that we need to take. Dr. Mario Sacasa, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and over the course of my career, I have tried to integrate the riches of our Catholic faith together with just what psychology and counseling theory actually say about healthy relationships and about a healthy psyche and healthy mind. If you've been struggling with stress and anxiety and haven't really known where to turn to, that's what this course is for. And so how this course is going to help you is that it's going to help you to think through your own stress response but it's also going to equip you through skills that we work on together throughout the course, whether that's breath work or through prayer exercises or meditation exercises that we do throughout the course to help you to be able to overcome your specific stress response. So the course is both educational, that you're going to grow and learn a lot about how you respond and how you're going to overcome it, while also being able to do some guided exercises together that's going to make it very practical for you to be able to utilize the lessons that we incorporate throughout this course. Everybody struggles with stress and anxiety, but not everybody knows where to go to. What are Catholic resources that are going to actually help us overcome stress and anxiety? If that's you, this course is for you. Welcome back. Now we're at the point in the show where I like to share a little bit of listener feedback with you or a listener question. And this week on Instagram, I heard from Jen and Jen sent me this message. She said, I listen to your podcast, so I know that I need to be praying every day, but can you help me to get motivated? I try to set aside some time in the morning, but when I go to pray, I just feel blah, like there's nothing there. 
It feels like there's no point or I start thinking about all of the more important things that I think I need to be doing, even though I know they're not actually more important. I just wish it didn't feel so hard to pray. Do you have any suggestions for me? All right. Thank you for that question, Jen. And this, I mean, this is such an important thing because this is something that we all struggle with. So first of all, know that you're you're not unique in struggling with this. And just know that prayer is a discipline. You know, um, I think that sometimes we think about it like, you know, it's good for us. God wants us to pray. So it should just should always just feel good and come naturally. But it's not like that. It truly is a discipline. So you're experiencing that like anything that's a discipline, like say, you know, that like, you know, going um, and and exercising is good for you. Well, you kind of need to motivate yourself to do it, right? It's a discipline and you need to work on making it a habit. But you can know that any good habit that you develop, it does become easier over time. It becomes so that it feels more natural and like you don't have to be fighting yourself every time you go to do it. And prayer for sure is like that. It's not going to be a battle every time that you go to pray. But it's important to know there's nothing wrong with you if it's a struggle and if you're having difficulty doing it. Like it is it is a discipline. It's something that's good for you. It's something that God intends for you. But it's going to take commitment on your part. And you really do need to develop that habit and kind of strengthen those kind of prayer muscles in a way, just working out in that way. I, I, I love to share this story of a friend of mine because I think it really has parallels with regard to habits in our spiritual life. Um, there was a friend of mine years ago who knew that I was running on a regular basis. And I've always enjoyed doing that. And uh, she, she said to me, you know what? I would like to be a runner. I would like to run too, but I tried it and I just get so out of breath. <laughs> and I was like, Yeah, um, that's part of the deal, right? Like, that's part of it. Like, she was thinking that meant she shouldn't run. But, you know, if you make that parallel between your prayer life and something like learning to run for exercise, that there really is a a comparison there. Because, yeah, you get out of breath. You might feel a little out of breath when you first are starting this discipline of daily prayer. It might feel a little uncomfortable. You might feel a little unsure of what you're doing. It's not going to feel great right from the start. And it's not going to feel easy. It might feel challenging for you even to do just a little bit. Like if you just go and run a half mile, if you've never run before, that's going to feel challenging. So, you know, start where you are and know that that getting out of breath part, the discomfort, there's nothing wrong with you if you experience that. That's part of it. But it does get easier over time. You can overcome that. You can get better at it. You can grow in your relationship with God, but also just in developing that habit of daily prayer. But even then, I mean, it's not going to always feel good. It's not about how you feel, right? It's a great gift to God that's just that you show up in prayer. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have fireworks every time and feel so connected and come away like, you know, walking on clouds. It's not always like that. I mean, of course, sometimes you're going to have these really beautiful moments of connection and prayer. And ultimately, it's a very good thing for you, but it's not always going to feel good. So just know that there's nothing wrong with you that this is a struggle. And know that like any good habit you might develop, it is worth working on and that it can get easier and become a more natural part of your daily routine over time. So know that, first of all, and also remind yourself, like, it's the enemy that wants to distract you, right? Who's putting those thoughts in your mind of all the more important things you need to be doing, right? Like laundry, like is laundry more important? I know I have this conversation with myself sometimes, like when I'm going to my my morning prayer time, I'll sometimes have the sudden thought like, oh, shouldn't I like unload the dishwasher first? Or shouldn't I, you know, fill in the blank with some stupid thing that all of a sudden in that moment feels a lot more important? Well, remind yourself of where that's coming from. And don't allow yourself to get pulled away or or duped in that way. And then finally, I, I want to suggest to you, Jen, that you might want to switch your approach to prayer. I don't know what you're doing for regular daily prayer, but if you're really struggling to make it a habit, maybe it's not connecting with you right now. It's not clicking with you right now. There's no one right way to do it. And sometimes we kind of think about prayer as one right way, like I must pray a daily rosary or daily prayer looks like reading scripture and meditating or, you know, fill in the blank with what you think it should look like. But there's so many ways to pray. You might try something a little bit different if it's feeling very blah to you, if you're feeling just kind of not alive in that daily prayer time, maybe incorporating music, you know, listening to beautiful sacred music can be a beautiful way to pray. Like what kind of sacred music do you enjoy listening to? That might be a a way that you would pray and meditate or reading scripture or 
you might make an, an hour at adoration, find a way or even switching up where you're doing it, like going outside for a walk while you pray or, you know, praying a rosary while you're, you know, doing something else or um, praying, you know, outdoors can be a nice way, but also just setting up a, a, a different area of your house where you pray or actually going to a church, stopping by a church and praying. Like these are ways that you can kind of mix it up and see what what feels good to you. Not that it's about feelings, but just see what what might help you to kind of open your mind to all of the different ways that God is calling you to connect with him. So it doesn't have to look like one right way. All right. I hope that's helpful, Jen. If you have a question like Jen did, you can always email it to me, danielle at daniellebean.com. I always love to have your feedback, your questions, your topic suggestions, because you know what? I do this for you. I'm here for you. So let's make sure the podcast is meeting your needs and answering your questions. And the best way you can do that is letting me know what's on your mind. You can also send me a voicemail at that same email address or connect with me on Voxer. The link to connect with me on Voxer is always in the show notes for the Girlfriends podcast over at goodcatholic.com. All right. I want to thank you for being here with me today. If you enjoy what we do at Girlfriends, will you leave us a review? If you're watching on YouTube, you can give us a rating and a, um, click that subscribe tab right here. But also, if you're listening through Stitcher or Spotify or iTunes, you can always leave us a review there. Your reviews help us to grow our audience here, really grow our community of listeners here at Girlfriends. It's a wonderful way that you can let us know that you are appreciating and enjoying the podcast. We're so grateful for you doing that. All right, that's all the time for today, but I want to thank you for being here. Thanks for being a part of the Girlfriends podcast. Until next time, I hope you enjoy your day and God bless your week.